Lorraine Ron. Lorraine went missing on April 26, 1980, in Manchester, New Hampshire. She was born on April 3rd in 1966. She would be 54 years old if she's still alive today. When her mother Judith arrived home at their apartment on Merrimack Street, she was shocked to find all the lights off in her apartment. Her 14-year-old daughter, Lorraine, should be home. Judith had gone for the day to a tennis tournament. Judith stepped into their second floor apartment with apprehension, noticing that the front door was unlocked and the back door was wide open. She entered Lorraine's bedroom hoping to find her sleeping, but Lorraine was not there. However, she was surprised to see that Lorraine's friend, who had been visiting, was asleep in Lorraine's bed. When asked where her daughter was, the friend said she was sleeping on the couch. While there was a, both a blanket and a pillow on the couch, along with Lorraine's shoes, the teen was nowhere to be seen. Judith called the police at 3.45 that morning to report Lorraine missing. Lorraine's friend admitted that since Judith was gone the previous evening, the two girls had a male friend over and the three hung out in the apartment drinking alcohol. At one point, the male friend thought he heard Lorraine's mom in the hallway, so he quickly left the apartment by the back door. The male friend said that he was certain that he heard Lorraine lock it behind him. Later on, the police would discover that someone had gone to the trouble of unscrewing all of the light bulbs in the apartment building that same night. When it was first reported, the police treated Lorraine's disappearance as a runaway situation, even though she had left her purse and shoes behind. After weeks, the police changed their stance, believing she may have met with foul play. In October of that same year, Judith discovered odd charges made to her home phone. Three calls had been made three months after Lorraine went missing from a motel out in Santa Monica, California. Two of the calls were made from a motel in Santa Ana and one to a teen sexual assistance hotline. In 1980, calls could be charged to your own number by calling the phone company and entering a PIN code. Doing this costs less than placing a collect call. However, Judith had absolutely no connections to anyone in California. After some investigating, it was discovered that the teen sexual assistance hotline was run by an unnamed physician out of California. This physician denied any knowledge of this line. In another instance, the Ron family thought they spotted Lorene at a Boston, Massachusetts bus terminal in 1981. For around a year after Lorene disappeared, Judith and her sister received phone calls in the middle of the night. The caller would pause a moment and then hang up. The sister received many of these strange calls. They slowed down but would happen at Christmas for years until Judith moved and no longer had that phone number. In 1985, the plastic surgeon from the teen assistance hotline changed his story, admitting that numerous runaway girls had visited his home, including one from New Hampshire. He claimed it was possible that this was Lorene. In a bizarre twist, the doctor implicated a notorious porn star by the name of Annie Sprinkle, saying that she had information regarding some of these runaways. It was about this time that the male friend from the night that Ron disappeared committed suicide. A private investigator, hired by Lorraine Ron's mother, discovered that one of the motels in California had been used by a child pornographer who went by the name Dr. Z. Although it appears the investigators were never able to link Dr. Z to the teen hotline itself. There was the same year a childhood friend of Lorraine's, Roger Morris, would receive a questionable phone call. Roger's mother answered this phone, saying that the caller identified herself as either Lori or Lorene. She claimed to be Roger's ex-girlfriend. The caller has never been identified and did not return the call. The last reported sighting of Lorene places her in Anchorage, Alaska, working as a prostitute in 1988. Judith has since relocated to Florida and remarried. She now believes that her daughter ran away to California to chase her dreams of acting and that it was she who placed the three phone calls from that state. As a footnote to the case, some believe that the disappearance of Laureen is linked to several other petite brunettes who disappeared around the same time from the same area. The most similar to the case of Laureen is another that happened in 1980 when 15-year-old Rachel Garden disappeared. Rachel was born on December 30, 1964. She was the eldest child of four kids and had a good relationship with her family. The only turmoil involving Rachel was that she often complained about having to babysit her younger siblings. Rachel was described as fun-loving, outgoing, and friendly, with an occasional rebellious streak. Generally a good kid, she was not one anyone would suspect would run away. When not in school, Rachel could be found spending her time with her horse, who she loved dearly. On the evening of March 22, 1980, Rachel walked to Rose Corner Market located on Route 108 in Newton, New Hampshire, where she was a regular customer. While at the store, she purchased some chewing gum and a pack of cigarettes with a $5 bill. Upon receiving her change, she departed from the store. This was at approximately 9 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. 
According to the owner of Rose Market Store, he saw Rachel walking down Main Street. Her family said she was planning on spending the night at a friend's house, which was located on the 50th block of the street. She would never arrive at her friend's house. On the morning of March 23rd, when Rachel still hadn't returned home, her mother knew something was wrong, and she reported her daughter missing to the police around 10 a.m. that day. Given Rachel's age, her disappearance was initially treated as if she were a runaway. According to one of her friends, she had considered running away around the time she vanished. Given this, no posters or flyers were put up around town at all. At the time, the police department had only one full-time officer. There was no mention of Rachel's disappearance in the town report for the year of 1980. When spoken to by investigators, the friend she was staying with that night, or was supposed to stay with, said she hadn't made plans with her at all. The friend never saw Rachel. It is unclear what Rachel's real plan was. A search of the woods where Rachel frequently went was conducted by a group of volunteer firemen and Boy Scouts. However, it produced no evidence or leads. While no wide-scale searches were done at all in relation to the case, helicopters were flown over the nearby wooded area, swamps, and fields to try to find a trace of the girl. A search of the garden home showed that Rachel had left behind all of her belongings. Years after her disappearance, two witnesses came forward to say that they had seen Rachel talking with three men in a dark-colored car near Rose Corner Market. It is reported that she knew the trio, who had reputations and were involved in criminal activity in the town. One of them would later serve time in prison for assault and rape. Allegedly, while at a bar in Haverhill, Massachusetts, one of the men confessed to killing Rachel. While specifics about his confession have not been released, it did prompt investigators to dig up a site off Route 108 behind a stone wall in a stream. However, no remains or evidence were found there. It is currently unknown if any of the men were involved in Rachel's disappearance, and none of them have been publicly named. In the 1990s, a major state police crime unit evacuated a 60-foot square patch of woods in town. No evidence was recovered. Another tip called in around 2008 led them to the Ice Pond and the Country Pond, which are both located within the area. Six hours were spent using sonar and GPS equipment to look at the bottom of Ice Pond as well as divers. No remains were located at that time. According to the police, they have chased each and every lead. They have stated that the case is still open and any new tips are being investigated. Voluntary disappearance is still considered a possibility in Rachel's case, as would also be considered the case with Lorraine Rom. These two cases took place very close together. Rachel disappeared on March 22, 1980. Less than a month later, on April 26, 1980, Lorraine would disappear from Manchester, which is only an hour away. While this is of course suspicious, there is no evidence linking the cases together. The general consensus among law enforcement is that she is no longer alive due to several anonymous tips that have come in and law enforcement does not believe the two cases are linked. As the years have gone by, their mothers have been reluctant to talk about the case. When Rachel was last seen, she was wearing a two-toned blue ski parka and carrying a dark bag with the word things on one side. At the time of her disappearance, she was five foot one and weighed approximately 100 pounds. She had light hair and hazel eyes. Both of her ears are pierced. If she's alive, she would be 56 today. I hope you've enjoyed today's stories. Please hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Stay safe out there.